and thanks for having me along. Uh, I think it's uh, it's good to have a, a primary care perspective on uh, on this issue, which uh, ultimately is really a primary care issue. And uh, just as a way of background, I first got involved in this, um, I think, what, two, maybe three years ago when I was uh, invited to a workshop uh, in Adelaide uh, where they were talking about patient blood management. And, uh, and I have to confess, I think patient blood management is, is a term that I don't particularly like because it, uh, it, it doesn't mean a lot for us in, in primary care. And uh, I think I was dragged along as a, as a token GP to that workshop. And uh, Trudy was there and, uh, and uh, Catherine Robinson was there. And, uh, and they were talking about all the issues about uh, uh, intravenous iron uh, in, in the hospital system. Uh, but listening to that, it, it occurred to me that this is really a bread and butter primary care problem that for some reason uh, we, we had uh, 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 not not being too adept at managing ourselves, and it had drifted into the hospital system. And with these new products available, it was uh, almost a no-brainer that uh, it should be done in uh, in general practice. So as I was coming over on the plane, uh, I was thinking about how how to progress the issue, and it was really coincident. Uh, it was a, a, a coming together of a lot of things at the same time. We have the expertise of Trudy and Catherine and so on, uh, but also at the same time, the Belmont Armadale Medicare Local uh, had an after-hours GP clinic um, operating, and uh, the CEO wandered down uh, to my office and he was asking me what he could do uh, with the space in, in, during the daytime because they had the staff and the GPs who also used to run the multicultural clinics and, and, a, and a few other clinics during the daytime. So that they had a bit of spare space and a bit of uh, nursing skills, and uh, and uh, concurrently I was thinking about this uh, iron iron infusion. So uh, the genesis of all of that was after much uh, dis discussion and toing and froing, is that we decided to set up a uh, a clinic uh, in the, in that after hours facility, and that's what I want to talk to you a bit a bit about today. And, and that idea was really a proof of concept uh, that you can do uh, these infusions in, 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 general, in, the, in the general practice setting safely, uh, effectively, and in a cost-effective way. And when we started it, we, there was some criticism around uh, for, from some uh, specialists who said we couldn't do it, uh, that GPs shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff uh, for reasons best known to themselves. So we were very careful uh, in setting up the clinic. Uh, we, we developed some very strict protocols and, uh, and, and we had a very strict monitoring process uh, in the early stages. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, really the next step from, from after sort of uh, proving that concept is that the next step is that we should be able to do this stuff in our own practices because it's not that much of a step to do that. And I, and I do, do some of the infusions in my own practice and I'll talk about some of the issues we, we have to deal with. So what, why aren't GPs doing iron infusions in general practice? And, and, and you guys probably know all of that. Is that I think, uh, we've, 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 uh, as, as we've heard in the earlier presentations, there's, uh, there's been a knowledge um, uh, gap over the last few years with the emerging evidence that really hasn't translated back into, in, in, into what we know. And, uh, and I was trained in the era that uh, Trudy was talking about. I mean, we, we used to transfuse people. When I was a registrar, we'd get yelled at if we didn't cross-match uh, cross enough units of blood. Uh, and if we didn't transfuse someone under, under 10, uh, we're, we'd get wrapped over the knuckles. So that was the era we were brought up in, and, and it was easy for us when we saw a patient with anemia to send them to hospital uh, for a transfusion. So, uh, so, and a lot of that new information just didn't, hasn't trickled through to us. Because I think there was a, a view that iron deficiency is one of those common problems, you've got tiredness, check their irons, and then you know, top them off with a bit of oral iron and leave it at that. So I think we've, we've been a bit slack. I think we've also become a bit de-skilled. Uh, when I talk to GPs in, in our area, 
uh, a lot of them aren't confident about uh, putting IV cannulas in anymore. Uh, so they're worried about that. Um, but we've got some great nursing staff around us who, who are more than keen and are able to do that. Time is, is, is probably the crucial issue. And we all know uh, we only got so much time in, in a day and to spend time uh, with a patient to do this stuff is a significant barrier. And at a very practical level, to within the days of IV polymaltose, when, when the infusion took a few hours, to actually have a, a patient um, tie up your room for that length of time uh, is, is, uh, is, is really not practical. And of course, the financial uh, issues, because there isn't a remuneration for, for IV iron infusion, so, uh, and, and your nursing time can't be reclaimed. So, that, so that's an issue. So we knew about all of those issues, but we also knew that the benefits of doing it in, in primary care were considerable. Patients love having their infusions close to home and done by someone they already know. The access, the, the fact that they can get an infusion in, in, in the Belmont case within a week is uh, significant. They can't get that in, in the public hospital system. And the continuity is really important because we can, we can ensure that not only do they get the treatment, but they also get the appropriate investigation and, and follow-up management afterwards. And of course, like anything in primary care, it's, it's very much patient-centred. And when we do the costings, and I'll show you this in a, in a little while, is that we can do these infusions in general practice at a fraction of the cost as, as, as to what it costs uh, the hospital system. And some of the private uh, uh, facilities are charging up to $4,000 for an infusion for, for their patients through their health funds, and we could do it for a, a tenth of that cost. So it ticks a lot of boxes. So in, uh, as a way of background, that's where the clinic, that's where Bentley Armadale Medicare Local is, which is sort of the other end of uh, Panorama Health. So it extends all the way from um, Belmont down to Armadale. They've actually got uh, three after hours facilities and the, and the one that we're using is up in Belmont which is up in the northern northern end. So it's not, uh, so it's about 10, 15 minutes from Royal Perth uh, so it's not too far away from, from, the, from the city but the uh, area covers quite a large uh, section. There's about uh, 300 GPs in the, in the area and there's about 100, 100 practices so it's quite big. That's what it looks like. Um, so it's a, uh, I, I work not too far away from it. it it's, it's probably uh, not in the, in the nice part of Belmont, and, it, and it's quite, uh, quite interesting uh, at night. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but during the daytime, it's quite safe. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the features of it is that, as, as I said, you, you can get in within, within a week at the moment. Uh, there's a, what we do is we do a, a pre-infusion evaluation, so the patients actually get checked before they have the infusion. So the GPs refer to them the, to the clinic, and then the nurses contact the patients and do a, a pre-infusion check over the phone. When they come in, they, uh, they get the uh, uh, iron infused uh, by the nurses under the supervision of a GP there. Uh, and, and we've chosen to uh, use uh, carboxymaltose uh, as our agent of choice. Um, and the reason for that was uh, that one, it's quicker. We can actually get patients turned around quite fast, as Trudy said. Uh, two, when we were setting up the clinic, that, that to us was the safest agent. And, and because it was a, a proof of concept, we were very uh, conscious that we didn't want to have any uh, uh, serious adverse events. Um, and, and thirdly, we didn't want to have several infusions. Uh, we, we did contemplating, contemplate having polymaltose as well as carboxymaltose, but uh, we thought the risk of ha infusing two different agents with two different protocols was too great. So, uh, so we stuck to the one agent, which is the carboxymaltose. And again, if you're doing it in your own practice, uh, I'd, I'd urge you uh, to do just the one agent uh, rather than to, it just reduces the risk because the protocols are different. Uh, it's cost effective, as I said. Uh, we started the infusion in August last, the clinic in August last year, 
and, and the carboxymaltose was not on the PBS then. And the cost of the drug was about, uh, for two ampules, was around $350, which the patients had to pay for, but everything else was bulk billed and there was no cost to the patient. So the only cost the patients had to endure was the cost of the agent, which the, in the pre-PBS days was uh, $350. And importantly, well, after the infusion was completed, the care returned back to the GP with, with some recommendations uh, for, for ongoing management. And because we knew about the, the, the knowledge gaps and so on, we, we also had a, a parallel arm with an educational program, which we ran these workshops there, but we also had an educational visiting program where a clinical pharmacist visited the GPs on a one-to-one -one basis and delivered a, a program. That program was uh, uh, devised in South Australia and they'd run it in some of their Medicare locals there with, with great success. And if you're interested in that, uh, contact Panorama Health and we could uh, uh, talk to them about how, how that could be uh, devised in your area. So what, what happened? So these, these are the outcomes. So these are our referrals. And as you can see, we, we started quite slow. And uh, in the early days, it was, it was really just a matter of ironing out the bugs and so on. And it was starting to take off in March, uh, but uh, after the PBS listing, it, it went through the roof, as you might imagine. Uh, but, but the trend was already rising before that, which is interesting because, remember, the patients actually had to pay for, for the cost before that. Um, it's gone up even further after that. And, and initially the clinic was two days a week and now it's running three days a week. So the numbers have uh, increased considerably. Um, who are we seeing? Uh, that's the demographic breakdown. And predominantly we're, we're seeing younger, uh, middle-aged uh, people. Uh, though as, as time, as, as our educational programs are kicking in, we're probably getting more referrals in that elderly group. And we're start, starting to see more uh, chronically ill patients as well. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, interestingly, that's the sex breakdown. And uh, out of 109 patients, almost 100 of them are female. Uh, which is surprising, but, uh, but I think that may, may refer, uh, refer back to the demographic breakdown. So who, who do we infuse? So we've been very conscious about having a very strict uh, criteria for indi uh, our indications uh, for the iron infusions. And this is essentially the, the list that uh, Trudy put up a, a little while ago. So we were very, at, when, when we started, uh, the message we wanted to get across to GPs was that the IV iron was only when the oral therapy was uh, failed and we actually broke down that because we wanted to know what the nature of that failure was. So we asked them to identify whether it was intolerance, which is a non-compliance or whether it was just lack of efficacy uh, and, uh, and all the other indications as you can see. And that's, uh, that's the breakdown. So with the vast majority of patients we're seeing at the clinic is because of uh, intolerance uh, to oral iron uh, or lack of efficacy. We're not seeing any in the, in the pre-op phase as yet, but I think that's because that message is just trickling through to our GPs. And I think we'll probably see, see more and more of that uh, as, as we go along. Uh, the intestinal malabsorption is interesting. Um, and again, uh, I think I think that's a that's an under a recognised uh, area for us because uh, I'm not sure whether the um, uh, gastroenterologists uh, are managing the inflammatory bowel disorder patients as well as they could. And uh, and I think if you actually went through your databases and actually uh, audited your uh, IBD patients, uh, you'd probably pick up a few patients that uh, that could benefit from treatment. So uh, what about the adverse events? Um, well, the, these data, were, when I put them up, uh, everyone's a bit surprised that we're, you know, we're getting about 40% are reporting some sort of adverse event. But you've got to take this with a grain of salt because we've, we've intensively 
looked for these adverse events. Uh, we've rung patients a few days after the, uh, the, uh, the infusion, uh, asked them how they're going, and we've checked them uh, with them after a week as well. So we've actually made a big effort to, to look for these things. And, uh, and fortunately, most of them are, are minor. Uh, a low-grade temperature is now the commonest one, uh, and headache uh, is the next, next common one. And the headache's interesting, as Trudy said. That's, that's probably the, most, the, the, the symptom that worries patients the most. And if you warn them beforehand, uh, it, it's not so much of a problem. Uh, the, uh, the headache can come up to a week afterwards, so it's a good idea to tell them that, uh, that they could get a headache in that period of time, because if they know about it, they're not going to ring you up and say, oh, what am I to do with my headache? Because sometimes it can be quite severe and, and they can get quite distressed, and uh, sometimes they could end up going to, going to an emergency department because of that. So they need to be told about the headache, uh, and, and we do that as part of our uh, pre-infusion evaluation. Uh, we had one uh, possible severe a adverse event. Um, when we looked at it, we, we don't think it was. It was a lady who got a, uh, who became unwell, became dizzy, uh, uh, got a fever and went to, uh, went to an emergency department. Uh, but when we looked at her lab indices and her admission there, it looked like she had a concurrent uh, viral illness, which she probably had before the infusion. So, but we've listed it as, as, a, uh, as, as, a, as a serious event because she had to go to ED, but uh, in reality, it probably wasn't. Uh, talking to Catherine Robinson in South Australia, as Trudy said, she's done about 10,000 infusions last year, and um, they've only had one, I think one or two, uh, serious events of note, and I think Fremantle's had one um, in, in the last year. So basically it's pretty safe, it is safe, and, uh, and if you, you, so you don't have to have any fears that, uh, that these patients uh, need resuscitation. Um, so who don't we do? Well obviously if the anemia is not due to iron deficiency we don't do them. <coughs> if they've got any uh, evidence of iron overload, hemochromatosis, we, we, we don't do it. If they've got a known hypersensitive to carboxymaltose, we don't do it. And as Trudy said, if they've, if they've had a reaction to polymaltose, it doesn't contraindicate them having uh, carboxymaltose. And to the contrary, it is that uh, that's, uh, the carboxymaltose is the, is the agent to try. And of course, in the first trimester, first trimester of pregnancy, uh, we don't do those. And, and in fact, we don't actually infuse anyone during the, the pregnancy period, and we refer them to King Edward. Again, that was uh, because we were just conscious about the, the safety aspect of it. Uh, uh, if they've got significant hepatic dysfunction, you, you, you have to be careful. And if they've got any acute or chronic infections, uh, again, I'd be very careful. And the, and the patients with, you know, the generalised allergic disorders, uh, you know, the patients who've got allergies to every, every drug uh, <laughs> that you give them, those are the ones you have to be a little bit more careful with. And you might even consider uh, an antihistamine or something beforehand uh, if you're worried. Uh, so when we got up to 50 patients, we looked at... Uh, because everyone was looking at this clinic and saying, you know, are, are you guys doing, doing these infusions for the right reasons? Uh, so, so we looked at uh, every referral that went through initially, I, I checked personally to make sure that they were appropriate. And out of, the, out of the 50, probably four of them didn't actually need an infusion that we actually had to send back to the GP. And inappropriate means that they hadn't tried Oraline for long enough. Uh, was, was the commonest reason. Uh, two of them wanted it done even before a week uh, for, for reasons best known to themselves. But, uh, and interesting, only three people knocked it back on, on the basis of cost. Uh, and we had an age criteria, which is uh, from 15 upwards, uh, uh, so one was uh, refused on, on that ground. So what were the, what were the clinical outcomes uh, we had? 
that uh, so of, and, and and this analysis is still in progress. So so this is uh, just raw data we're looking at. So we've seen that the inf average ferritin pre-infusion <coughs> was 12, and six weeks uh, after infusion. So after the after they get after the patients go back to their GPs, we ask them to do a ferritin at six weeks. Uh, fortunately, most GPs are doing that for us, which is great, and sending us back the results. So we've been able to track that with, with the haemoglobin. And as you can see, the average ferritin's been quite a substantial rise, and the haemoglobin's also gone up. And breaking that down, and I'll just put this up for interest, doesn't have any error bars or, on it as yet. So that's uh, just a snapshot of patients uh, showing you the pre and post ferritins, and it's, it's uh, some of it is quite quite impressive rises. But what's interesting, and I, and I guess Michael might have some thoughts on this. Uh, this is probably beyond my capacities as a simple GP. But there are some patients like number 16 who have had a very very small rise in ferritin, and compared that to say number 10 who've had a huge rise. And why some patients respond more than others is um, uh, interesting, I think. <laughs> so you see interesting uh, things. There may be some issue with hereditary carrier protein deficits. Did that patient's hemoglobin go up? Yes, it did. So it's interesting looking at this sort of data because it probably it actually raises a few few questions uh, as well, which uh, which is quite interesting to, to look at later. Uh, so anyway, so we saw the clinical outcomes, which are great, uh, but then we thought, well, what's really important for patients is you know what, how they feel about it. So we had a um, uh, honor student from Notre Dame who's done a study on uh, on a subset of patients. Uh, uh, qual qualitatively to look at their uh, perceptions and, and uh, thoughts on the, on the infusion. Um, sorry, surveys is misspelled. But uh, uh, so she had quite a good uh, response rate. So it was a question, and then she actually had a semi-structured interview. And what the patients liked best was that they liked the fact that the procedure time was so short that they could get in and out quickly. They, they loved the, the staff, the, the, the friendliness of the staff and just the interaction with the staff and, and that pre-infusion assessment where someone rang them and went through the pr procedure was, uh, was appreciated and they, and they liked the convenience that they could go to somewhere relatively local, they can drive in, have the infusion and drive out. So they don't have all the hassles about transport to hospitals and, and, and so on. Uh, the things that they thought we could improve on, and this was before the PBS, uh, needless to say, they, they, they thought the cost of the drug was too high, which is probably not surprising. Uh, but interestingly, they, they thought um, that we could have improved on, on, on some uh, process for telling them what to do after the infusion if, if they had a, had a reaction. Uh, and some of them talked about having an action plan or, or, or something. Uh, uh, that they could work off, uh, which is valuable. So in terms of uh, satisfaction, uh, you know, the general satisfaction was uh, almost 100%. Uh, and again, the, uh, the comfort of the clinic and the staff interactions were rated highly. Uh, so that was all uh, useful information. Now I'm just going to talk to you about the things you need to do. If you, if, this is all doable in general practice, uh, and so what do you need to do if if you wanted to set up a uh, an infusion in your practice? What do you need to do? And it's it's uh, it's not that difficult. So you need a bit of equipment. Uh, you need some cannulas, some bags. Uh, you need an IV giving set or a pump. You need to have resource equipment, which you should have anyway in your treatment rooms uh, and you need some protocols uh, that you can follow and I'll go into that. So that's what the BAML clinic looks like. Um, so that's the chair we're using and that's the chair that um, they use in renal dialysis. Uh, but you can do these in, on your treatment room beds quite easily. And if you get confident because the 
risk of a reaction is so small. I, I do them on, on the chair now with, with a bed uh, close by. But uh, if you wanted to be fancy, that sort of uh, chair is, uh, is the way to go. And those chairs are expensive. They're, that cost Bamel about uh, $5,000. As you can see, there's a, uh, a recess trolley, the pumps there. And when I looked at that photograph, the other important thing you need is a clock uh, just to, for, for the time, so, so have, have one handy. So what do you do before the process? You need, need to get consent. Now, in general practice, as you know, we already have consenting processes, so you can either modify the consents you normally do or, or get some sort of verbal consent, but it has to be documented. Uh, patients need some information. They need to know what, what to bring to, uh, to the infusion. Uh, they need to know what to expect um, in terms of all, all the adverse events and the headaches. So you need to develop some sort of standard sort of protocol and some information sheets uh, that they need to bring. And you need to give them some idea of cost. Because if you're doing in your general practice setting, you need to have some sort of cost recovery, remembering that there isn't an MBS uh, uh, item for infusion that you can charge for a consultation. Now I know Trudy, uh, and her colleagues have um, are advocating for us to get an MBS item number, but that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's in the future. And you also have to remember that if they're taking oral line, th that they need to stop it before they have the infusion. Uh, so the dose calculation uh, Trudy talked about, uh, traditionally when I, when I was training we were taught about the Ganzoni formula, which I confess I could never understand. Uh, fortunately there's that simplified schedule which uh, Trudy talked about. So what we do at, uh, in my clinic and, and at Belmont is that we use that table and essentially uh, most people fall into that 50 to 70 uh, kilogram uh, bracket. Uh, and if their hemoglobin is over 100, which most, most of them tend to be, they get one dose of 1,000 milligrams, which is two ampules uh, of the pharynject. Uh, now, the PBS listing for carboxymaltose, just to remind you, is um, you get two ampules in one repeat, but the PBS indication is for iron deficiency anemia. So if they're not anemic, they, they're not covered on the PBS. So they still have to pay for the drug if they're iron deficient and not anemic. So most of them will, will, will get away with the two ampules, which is 1,000 milligrams, and they don't need a second dose. However, if their hemoglobin is, is lower, uh, they, they may need to come back for another 500 milligram dose uh, later on. And if, if their weight's higher, then, uh, then the doses need to be adjusted. But that's a very nice, simple table, um, and, and we just follow it like a mantra. Uh, I put that, that's the Ganzoni formula. Uh, I only put that up to show you that I knew it, so yeah, if any, <laughs> uh, but don't ask me how to interpret it. Uh, and I think the, the uh, PI on the, or somewhere it, it says, if you're going to use the Ganzoni formula to contact a clinical pharmacist, so. Uh, because they apparently know how to do these things. So, so if you're worried about uh, dosing, and if you want to get the dose absolutely accurate for whatever reason, then that's what you need to use. Uh, but I suggest you talk to uh, your pharmacist uh, on, on how, to, how to work it out. Uh, so in terms of, just for the, for the nurses here, so the, just a, these, there's a few tips from my, my, my nurse. Uh, so what we do is we actually put the cannula in first, and we put it in the forearm. Uh, try to avoid the back of the hand because it's a bit more painful. And because the drug is expensive, we actually put the cannula in first to make sure we actually get the cannula in before we break the ampule. So get the cannula in, then get the equipment set up, add the iron to the, to the solution, and then flush the cannula so that you're absolutely sure you're in the vein. Because as, as Trudy said, if you're not in the vein, you get extravasation, and you get the staining and you don't make any friends doing that. Um, so, uh, so make sure that the cannula is, uh, is, uh, is in and then you hook it up. Uh, observations, again, what we do is we do a baseline temperature pulse, uh, risp and blood pressure. 
Uh, we check it at five minutes uh, and then at the end of the infusion. And, uh, and I know Trudy will argue the point, but uh, we keep them waiting for half an hour after the infusion and that's, that's, uh, that's historic more than uh, necessary, but, uh, uh, but we keep them waiting in the, in the waiting room and check them afterwards before they go home. Uh, but as Trudy's pointed out, if, got, if they're going to get a reaction, they'd get it during the infusion and, and you'd know about it. Uh, what are the adverse events? Uh, so if they get pain uh, at the injection, if they get severe pain, it means that the, the uh, uh, drug may have extravasated. Uh, so you've got to stop the infusion straight away. Uh, and that's why the, you should have someone with them at all times a nurse with them at all times as, as the infusion's uh, progressing. If you get all those immediate reactions through is talked about, and, and as I've told you, we haven't seen any of that uh, in our experience, and that's highly unlikely, but if you get any of that, uh, they're getting an immediate reaction and you have to treat them appropriately. The late reactions I've talked about, the hypophosphatemia, I'm, I'm not sure uh, about the significance of that. Uh, we don't routinely uh, test uh, the levels uh, on our patients. Uh, I'm not sure whether we should, and that's probably a conversation I'll have with Trudy at some point. But uh, uh, so I think the jury's out on that, uh, and I guess as more data comes in, we'll we'll, uh, we'll get some guidance on that. And uh, just a uh, just a reminder, GPs of and, uh, and I put myself in this. We're very, very bad at reporting adverse events. So if you get an adverse event, you should report it because that's the only way we can actually collect information on the on the safety of these agents. Um, so in conclusion, so uh, so I think we, we've demonstrated that uh, that. Iron infusions can be done in general practice. We can do them safely, we can do them effectively. Patients love it, uh, but there's still some barriers for us to do it in our own practices. So the BAML facility is there for you. Uh, they, they've opened their, up their clinic for, to accept referrals from anywhere in Perth now, so it, they're not bound by those geographical areas. So if you do have a patient, uh, they, they'd be happy, happy to take them. The referral form is on, on their website and it's just a matter of sending, faxing that in and the, and the nurses will organise it for your patients. But it is a bit of, bit of a, uh, a journey for, for, for your patients from here. Uh, that there are other uh, entities that are uh, organisations that are doing infusions. Uh, there's uh, a group of nurses uh, called uh, Chemo at Home uh, who who at the moment are pro providing IV chemo facilities for, for patients to be done at home, and those nurses are also providing an IV uh, iron uh, access, uh, but that's for privately insured patients. Uh, Silver Chain have uh, been toying with the idea of doing it, and I don't know where they're at, uh, but they were going to use their hospital in the home program to do it, uh, and, I, and I'm not aware that they've started as yet. Um, but at the moment, they're, they're the only other organisations that I'm aware of that are doing it in, at, a, at a community level. So if, you wanted, so if you're doing it in general practice, I, I think what we need to do is we need to train our, our nurses to, to be adept at cannulating and, and, and doing most of this, uh, uh, the monitoring and, and follow-up for us. Uh, and uh, we've spoken to Panorama Health, who've kindly organised a IV cannulation uh, uh, educational program for early next year, and they're taking expressions of interest. So anyone who's interested in learning uh, and becoming more skilled in that, uh, that's what I suggest you do, is to get the training, and then what you need to do is get some practice. And one way, in the way we, uh, we got our nurses at BAML, uh, uh, skilled was they, they went to Fremantle Hospital who kindly uh, gave them some access through their clinics and they got some uh, practice on uh, on patients there. Uh, the other way of practicing is of course is to is to uh, do vini punctures and actually take blood from patients. Uh, the reimbursement is an issue uh, because the, the item numbers are restricted. What I do in my practice is that we cost recover uh, from the patients for for the equipment and the nursing time. Uh, 
Uh, and again, you need to work out how that uh, costing works for you. So I give my patients a choice of going to the Bama clinic or, or having it in my practice, and, and, a, and a number of them prefer to have it at my clinic even though it costs them a bit more. And that's because of that familiarity. So patients actually put a, put a value on that. The, the cost of the consumables, my, uh, my practice manager's done some costings on that. So if you sort of budget on, on you know, a missed cannulation and so on, it works at about $20, $20 for the consumables. And then, then you need to put a, put a figure on your nursing time and, and recover that. Uh, the facilities, uh, I think your treatment room should be pretty well equipped, but remember these patients will only occupy your treatment room for about half an hour. Uh, so that's the sort of time frame you're looking at. Uh, I think we need, you need to have some standard protocols, um, some uh, systems for consenting and, and, and guidelines for follow-up and so on. So you need to work on all of that. Uh, we're happy at BAML to share those protocols with you but you, you need to give that some thought. It's also important uh, to, to reinforce what Trudy and Michael have said, that uh, treatment for iron deficiency is, uh, is only one component. You've still got to do the monitoring, the follow-up, and the investigations. So, so you need to integrate all of that into your management plans. If you've got worries about compliance, adherence, uh, I suggest a medication review with a, with a pharmacist because they're great at doing that, and this is, this is tailor-made for a, for a, uh, a, a pharmacist uh, to do, uh, do some medication. Uh, the blood safe e-learning, everything is, uh, this whole area is, is changing rapidly. Uh, I'm a great fan of that, uh, and, and that's, not, and that's uh, after looking at lots of e-learning packages, I think that's one of the better, best ones around, and it really is quite slick, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, ve it's very impressive. And I think there's also, uh, from a primary care perspective, I think there's a lot about iron uh, deficiency that we need to learn more about, and, and, and there's a lot of research to be done. So I think when, uh, when you, when, if you get into this area, uh, I'd urge you just to, just to keep, keep a research hat on as well. Okay.